Yael Lasowski with the Consumer Choice Center going to show us the, the way into the weekend uh, as uh, we come to you. Uh, 26 minutes in front of the hour. Uh, Consumer Choice Radio airs on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. here on the Big Talker FM. ConsumerChoiceCenter.org, their website, the grassroots movement for consumer choice around the globe. Yael, once again, broadcasting from Vienna, Austria, with us here in Wilmington this morning. Yael, my friend, I hope uh, your week has been a great one for you. Oh, sure has. Plenty of ups and downs, but I think we're going to have a good weekend ahead of us. Actually putting some uh, pulled pork there on the uh, on the smoker and uh, going to have a good time. So March is Uh-oh. looking up. Uh-oh. Uh, with that said, uh, are you? did you have to uh, send a, a written note to all of your neighbors in your complex to make sure c- that no one uh, you know, calls the police on you? Because remember where you went down the road this past year when you decided to you know, be a rebel uh, that you are and uh, you know, smoke some meat in the middle of your courtyard? Yeah, this time we took the right precautions, Joe. We're, g- we're going to do this uh, at a friend's house. They're a bit further away <laughs> from the big city. And uh, kind of lessens uh, the impact of perhaps having the cops show up when you're just smoking some meat on the grill. Well, you know, easy way to buy off the cops, obviously, in Vienna is to give them a little you know, taste of uh, what you're smoking. No, is that uh, the way you lobbied them the last time? Oh, you know, we, we offered. You know, they, they could have had a little bit of smoked turkey, but uh, I guess, you know, maybe they were kosher. Who knows? Uh, did not uh, <laughs> take a bite, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yesterday, uh, our commander in chief, meaning the 46th president of the United States, his name is Joe Biden. We know him better as Grandpa Joe uh, on this program. Uh, he took uh, t- to the stage and uh, addressed the American people, uh, of course, uh, signing a $2 trillion, uh, what we know it as a COVID relief bill. Uh, there are many other terms that could be appropriately assigned uh, to this piece of legislation, but, uh, you know, in the form of the way in which uh, they are bringing it to us as COVID relief. I mean, who's to say that it's not? Uh, it says it's COVID relief. Uh, so why would we be you know, thinking that uh, any other money might be allocated to something else in this $2 trillion bill? Uh, when we look at this uh, helicopter money, as you, you call it, uh, you know, $1,400 per person sounds like a good thing for a lot of people who are struggling out there. $1,400 goes a long way for a lot of different people across our country uh, for maybe a a couple of weeks or maybe a month. Uh, But when you look at the overall $2 trillion package, I mean, just divvy it up. If you're going to do it evenly among all Americans, you know, you're looking at maybe a fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar paycheck, along with the the other two pieces of legislation. Uh, you could have just forked over like forty grand to a household. Instead, uh, we'll be giving three and a half billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. At the end of the day, you know, you know what is the real cost of this uh, to the American people? Yeah, and I think that you know, to begin, we obviously know that a lot of people are hurting. Many people have not had their businesses open. People have been out of work. And any kind of relief or any kind of plan that's put together that will get money directly in the hands of the people is something that people obviously like and in many cases actually is very helpful. Now, the question becomes, what is exactly in the $1.9 trillion? I know you've had Brad Palumbo on to discuss you know, some of the different projects and plans, but realistically, this is a huge payoff to many of the constituencies of the Democratic Party. There's a plenty of different, you know, big union bailouts in there. There's a lot for pension plans. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that is not in exactly the world of COVID relief. And I think that's, that's it's very sad because that means that in the future, when they make the argument that we need to raise taxes, they're going to have all the ammunition they need. And this is exactly what's going to happen. It means that my child is going to have to pay more in the future, Joe. It means your child will have to pay more in the future. And we could pay in the next five to 10 years if we have some kind of inflation and the value of our money goes down. I know most Americans don't see this every day. However, what I see every day whenever I'm you know, transacting between euros and USD and trying to figure out how to, how to survive on either is that you know currency conversion is a big market. And there are a lot of signals there. And if we have like just a tad bit of inflation, you could see the value of the U.S. dollar go down. That would be very bad for everybody. I think we don't need to uh, belabor that point. But this is the kind of thing where I wish that we just had the money that went to the individuals who needed it. We didn't have this huge payoff. I think that would be a much better program. And, and even when we talked with Steve Forbes on our program, that's what he said is like, look, I'm not normally for these large bailouts, surely not for trillions. Uh, being printed up out of nowhere to be handed out. 
But if you're going to help people in the middle of a pandemic, get that money to people's hands directly. Need and it. that's it. That's it. And get it to the people who need it most. Uh, it just, uh, you know, and that would become a, a very complicated rather than just writing a check to everyone uh, like uh, they're going to, at least if, if you make below what the threshold is. You know, our argument is, and, and uh, I know you follow Dave Ramsey, as he said uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, you know, if you're making $75,000 a year, $60,000 a year, uh, generally in America, uh, if you're making 60 grand a year and still have a job, uh, what is $600 going to do for you? Or what is $1,400 going to do for you? Now, that's not to say that, uh, you know, that $60,000 a year person may be without a job and, uh, you know, unemployed and unable to find work and has all of these other expenses that are piling up uh, that this thing could be carved out for somebody like that. And we know that there are many people who make a lot less and are in a much different situation and a more difficult uh, uh, place in life. Uh, our argument, as you kind of mentioned, uh, is uh, that, Let's uh, put the focus on the people who need it most and, uh, you know, not all of these different sorts of uh, programs and other types of uh, spending that will go to, as you mentioned, you know, mismanaged states. You know, I made the you know, question kind of uh, a comical one earlier. You know, are all of the people moving to Florida and North Carolina out of the state of New York once the Empire State is bailed out? Will they be moving back to New York because the Governor Cuomo and uh, their General Assembly will start making decisions because they'll be able to start with a clean slate, eliminate their budget shortfall, fix the pension issues? Will they then lower the tolls and lower the tax threshold for people to attract people back to their state? Do you think that will actually happen in a place like New York or New Jersey or Illinois now that they're going to be bailed out? Absolutely not. You know, it's all about a political <laughs> culture and the political culture in Illinois and New York and New Jersey. It's pretty clear. And it's been that way for a long time. You know, there is a lot of, of people who walk down those hallways and they wield a lot of power. And, you know, that's unfortunate because that's kind of how things are always going to go. And you're not really going to see some big shift. And I think we have to realize that now, all these months later, a year later, most of this stuff is kind of a smokescreen. And what I'm really concerned about, Joe, and I think many of your listeners, it's probably the same, is are we going to allow our political leaders to hold on to this kind of power going forward? I mean, most of the emergency declarations that have been offered by governors have actually been uh, you know, put down in the courts. And there is actually growing skepticism about certainly the constitutionality of everything that's been done in the last year. We have to stay vigilant, and we cannot allow our governors and sort of our local city councils to just have this much power on all, uh, I guess, all commerce, everything related to our private life. It was, it's gone a bit too far. I know many people are still very afraid to say this because they're obviously scared of the virus. They're scared that their family might get sick, that they might get sick uh, without the vaccine. They're not sure that they can kind of speak up. But somebody has to do it because we cannot allow this kind of thing to continue. And there are a lot of plans in Europe that they're cooking up at the moment for these vaccine passports to try to track people and make sure that, you know, you have the vaccine before you're allowed to go anywhere. There's all kinds of stuff that people are cooking up. And many politicians and political leaders around the world have, have just seen this as sort of the, the witch's cauldron where they're able to try everything they've ever wanted to do. And I think that's very concerning. We have to go back to what our constitution is about, to what our societies are about. And there's got to be some measure of responsibility. The entire fact that we had all these lockdowns, people were not able to make decisions for themselves, was incredibly paternalistic. Uh, that's definitely something that Consumer Choice Center, we're going to be fighting against. And uh, we're going to be very vigilant because, uh, look, there aren't too many of us out there who are making these points and being able to get that message across. Well, and there are efforts underway in states like North Carolina, Texas, New York uh, to create a system of checks and balances uh, for the top executive in each of these respective states, meaning the governor, to allow more input uh, and conversation within all elected officials and particularly those who have the statewide uh, recognition in that executive branch, meaning their name is on the ballot all across the state and not just in one certain district or another, and that uh, you know any emergency that goes beyond uh, 25, 30 days, uh, you know you need to have some type of consensus amongst these groups of people before you shut down your business or lock down the schools and uh, you know create a situation that we all lived through over the past year. I think that is you know just one small step. 
that we can make it to bring in some accountability and transparency into the system. We'll see if it gains any traction. I mean, I've posed this question to various guests. Uh, Yael, do you, could you ever in your mind fathom a political elite uh, you know, signing off on a piece of legislation that would limit their power and influence uh, should this legislation make its way to the governor's desk? Well, surely not in our current political climate. You know, that's <laughs> that's something that many politicians are, are just not going to sign up to do. Uh, there are some people, you know, in some circumstances that would actually submit because they understand what the Constitution is and they understand the actual role of states. And that is very unique to our republic. And it's something very beautiful. It's something that I think still provides an example around the world and uh, continues to animate a lot of debate about the role of government, the role of a private individual society, and our own role in it. Yeah, yeah, let me ask you, you know, off topic here for just a moment before we get to the pressing issue of the royal family and the divide there, because I know it's been capturing Europe's attention, I'm sure, and has been front page news all week here in the U.S., despite the fact that, that uh, Meghan Markle is not a U.S. citizen and uh, we broke away from the U.K. in the year 1775 for our own independence, somehow this was top news as the $2 trillion bill was getting pushed through without much uh, media coverage on all of the other little nuggets that we have highlighted extensively here on this program. Amazing how that all works, uh, the distract uh, the distraction of you know Meghan Markle, Pepe Le Pew, and uh, you know Mayor Pete being a you know cool dude in the Department of Transportation, uh, according to Market Watch, uh, it's uh, very difficult right now for those who are abroad to get into the U.S. and uh, turn it around. And the same thing uh, in Europe with these restrictions. Although on our southern border here in the U.S., uh, they're allowing those who arrive by land to enter the country without a COVID test, and those who are arrive and are positive, they come in anyway. How does that make you feel as somebody who has family in the U.S. and you haven't been able to see him for four or five months? Yeah, I've seen these, this news, and it really is concerning. I mean, look, I'm the most pro-immigration guy uh, who probably exists and who's on the radio <laughs> ever. But in this circumstance, this is a political decision. We've seen a lot of this early on from the Joe Biden administration. It's really not the moderate Joe Biden that we all saw in the debates. Uh, he had to hire a lot of people, and a lot of those people are pretty extreme and would rather that we just to let anyone in without any checks or anything. And again, I'm a very pro-immigration person, but if you have a standard to where citizens are treated with much harsher restrictions than people who are trying to claim asylum or people who are illegally crossing into the border, that's, <laughs> come on, that's not <laughs> something that we can have. And, and again, I'm, I'm someone who's very in favor of immigration. I, I was an immigrant myself. But to see a standard for American citizens... And a standard for everyone else who might just happen to come here, you know, by way of a coyote, uh, that's very troubling. And it really makes us wonder what are the priorities of the Joe Biden administration, because it seems as if he's got some wokes in the ranks that are actually running the show here. It seems. I mean, he only comes out every 10 minutes uh, once a day. For 10 minutes, he's allowed out of his uh, basement and then uh, you know makes a quick speech on a teleprompter, no follow-up questions, and then it's back to the basement to, and let the wokes uh, run the day in the White House. That's at least what it looks like uh, from my vantage point, uh, you know, a couple of hundred miles away uh, here on the Carolina coast. And Yael, I think that is also another misconception that gets spun in the media in that uh, anyone that is uh, you know, on the right side of uh, thinking when it comes to politics is that they are anti-immigrant. No, I think uh, you know, in large part, uh, like myself, who would not be here if it were not for my family immigrating to here many, many moons ago, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago, that uh, we would not be in this position we are today. Uh, it's the, the fact that it gets spun to the point where they use the divide and conquer tactic uh, to say, well, they don't look like you, so you are against them coming into the country. When we know that that's not the case, you look at any poll or survey, vast majorities of Americans are open to an immigration uh, freely you know, to get into our country, but there's a process, that process should be followed, and that system needs to be totally overhauled. That is you know, the viewpoint I think many people have across the board in this country, yet it gets spun as a, a racial issue or some other type of uh, you know, topic that creates more division on the issue rather than actually fixing the problem. And at the end of the day, who wins out? Well, the elites win out and uh, you know, those who are able to you know, skate the system and, and come in and then enjoy all the benefits of, of being here in America. Now, Joe, we'll crack open the uh, history book here real quick. But uh, if we remember back in Vietnam, there are a lot of Vietnam refugees, you know, who are leaving, who did not agree with the communist government. 
and they moved to the United States. And what did all of these people become? They became usually Republicans, entrepreneurs. They became, you know, low, uh, we'll say low tax, small government people because they had understood exactly what had happened with the oppression in a place like Vietnam. It's much the same with what's happening in Florida and the Cuban population, which is very much reactionary against uh, much of the socialism that is uh, sort of discussed so readily in too much of our politics. And that's something that we all need to contend with, is that not every single immigrant who shows up at the door is going to have a particular angle. And I think a lot of people who are more right-wing definitely understand that and know that. But it is about following the rules, it is about having a process, and it is about giving people opportunity, because it really is about fairness and equity. And the more that we can do that and offer that to people who come and immigrate to our shores, much like I did, that means that we're able to contribute to the American dream and actually provide you know, that great level of American spirit, not just to our kids, to our community, but that's exactly what you know our republic is all about. And it's something I'm, I'm very happy to still be able to contribute to as uh, as the American government uh, takes my income tax money and <laughs> sucks it up uh, to pay for certain things. But yeah, Joe, that's uh, it's a great spirit in the country. Uh, well, and no question. And uh, I, I think on that, we, you often find those like yourself and others who uh, get the opportunity to come here, they do it the proper way and they move forward. Uh, you end up becoming one of the more knowledgeable and well-versed, uh, you know, people in our society that are able to, you know, talk about the history of this country and its ability to lift people up from oppression due to the capitalism and uh, the the free markets and uh, the way of life uh, here in the U.S. And uh, it is oftentimes immigrants like yourself are more appreciative and understanding of how that process works as compared to the, you know, the Joe Schmo everyday U.S. citizen who takes everything for granted. Yeah, <laughs> you could imagine me taking that U.S. citizenship exam, you know, after having been through many courses of, you know, AP U.S. history was a breeze. And I think I did it blindfolded while one arm was behind my back. So I think I did pretty good. Right. Right, yet, thir yet like 60% of our U.S. citizens uh, would not be able to pass uh, that uh, citizenry test. What uh, color is the White House? <laughs> <laughs> really? That was a question? That was a oh question, of course. Uh, well, who's to say it's white, yeah, yeah? We're living in 2021. Uh, I want to say it's orange. Uh, you'll prove me wrong. Well, of course, yeah, and the Canadians <laughs> burned it down in 1812, so who knows? It could be a, a whole other story behind that. I think it's cream colored, actually, <laughs> with a rainbow on top. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you. You know, I'm sure in the UK this has been a lot of talk, uh, and across Europe uh, this week, uh, the Queen and the divide with uh, you know Harry and Meghan. Uh, I can't believe this is the distraction and topping the news cycle for a number of days. Uh, Share your thoughts, if you will, on this uh, situation with the royal family. Megan is not; she's a Canadian citizen, is, uh, if uh, I'm uh, correct, right? No, no, she, she's up. she's a U.S. citizen. I will oh, have she's to correct. Yeah, I'll I have thought to she correct was denouncing it. I thought. I no, forgot. no, no, no. Renouncing is actually very difficult, Joe. You actually need to pay a portion of your wealth to the government. So oh. I, d I doubt she'll be doing that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's called the uh, expatriation tax. Uh, there's actually one of the founders of Facebook who did that. He moved to Singapore. He ended up having to pay $20 million to the federal government. Mm. So let's look at this real quick, Joe. I look at it sure. meta. Let's look at it like producers. So perfect setup. You know, they did the, the, the days before the production. We see Oprah. We see the little clips and the freshers. We see the reaction of Harry. They're just pumping and priming to get a reaction from the royal family. I see this as the crown season, you know, 85 or whatever. Like, they're just <laughs> pumping us and priming us. We live in an entertainment society. That's something that we all kind of forget. You know, once the day's over, we're all going to, you know, log in and stream. And we saw that kind of, that that new entertainment, uh, political meshing with much of identity politics, which is very unfortunate. So that was kind of just how I saw it. I don't have any uh, big take. I think it's interesting that many Americans side with Meghan Markle while most of the Brits are very much against her. And it just comes down to yet another argument. It's as if we're having the American Revolution all over again, you know? <laughs> Is... Quickly, let me ask you, you know, in that you live in Europe uh, and, uh, you know, when we talk about pride that uh, one has for their nation, uh, where, wherever it may be, in Italy, France, uh, you know, Germany, Austria, 
the UK, for instance, uh, you know, while you can pass for freely and it's very easy to get to and from many different countries just because of the, uh, the geography of everything, uh, are the Spaniards very proud of being from Spain and differentiate themselves from the UK or, you know, the Italians very proud to be from Italy and the country they live in, or is it just kind of a, a mishmash? You know, I just want, want to get kind of the, the feel for what European life is like for the everyday citizen, depending on which country you live in. What is so strange, Joe, is this is actually one of my side hustle topics that I love, but most people in Spain, you have to imagine they have a brewing constitutional crisis of separatism that happens every year. Uh, you have the people in Catalonia, the Catalans, uh, you know, they organize their own referendums every couple of years, and they actually just stripped the former prime minister of Catalonia of his immunity. So he's actually going to be arrested for having organized a free vote on whether or not Catalonia, which is a part of Spain that's like Barcelona, should be free. And it's, in Italy, it's much the same. You have the northern part of the country. You know, it's very industrial. They have a lot of money. The south is kind of mafiosos. And there's a lot of, you know, separate uh, separatist movements. There is a lot of clashes within. It's the sort of urban-rural divide. But, you know, general pride is just not something that exists here. It's actually frowned upon in Germany and Austria, you know, for obvious reasons. Nationalism, being proud, patriotism. It's not something that you often see. You don't really see flags anywhere by private people. You only see it basically where the government is. No one is going to have an Austrian flag in their yard. Uh, people think that guy's a weirdo. So <laughs> it's just not something that exists. And I think that's why the, the U.S. is certainly unique. You know, you have people who are very proud of their country, of their system. And it is something that is, instead of being based on history, which is Europe, it's based on an idea and philosophy and everything that our founding documents laid forth, that is what our society has created. And I think that's why we can be very proud and uh, why it still is one of the best countries in the world, no matter what they say, no matter what you read in those papers. Yael Lasowski with the Consumer Choice Center. You can catch uh, Yael and his tag team partner, David Clement, uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. right here on the Big Talker FM, latest edition of Consumer Choice Radio. Yael, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for the insight and conversation this morning. Yes, sir. Let's go smoke some meat. Let's smoke some meat. Uh, Yael, going to go out on a limb there. The rebel he is in Austria, smoking meat outdoors. Uh, may get the cops called on him like he did during Thanksgiving. <laughs> Heaven forbid. All right, we're moving up into the top of the hour, uh, the latest in cancel culture to wrap up the program after this timeout.